Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you, Lord. Thank you very much for this valuable time you have given in our lives and brought us together through this uh, platform to study your word and to learn about you, Lord. Lord, I pray everything that we learn may help us to experience you more closely and more intimately. Open our hearts and minds and reveal yourself to us and especially in us. As we are discussing, Lord, our, our discussions may be encouraging to one another and edifying us, Lord. Everything we do and everything we speak and may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And we submit the rest of the time, the one hour that we spend in uh, studying your scripture to the throne of grace, asking for your mercy so that you may reveal yourself to us. Thank you very much for listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Praveen. And once again, uh, well, good morning to uh, our dear couple in uh, North Carolina and good evening to all of you here in Hyderabad. Uh, and good to see that Doris is joining us too. Thank you for joining us. Well, we have been uh, studying the subject uh, of God's grace and uh, we tried to answer several questions. Last time we met, uh, we discussed what is God's grace and why do people need God's grace? Uh, what is forgiveness of sin? Uh, and we also discussed the question, does forgiveness mean that God condones sin? Now, in the course of our discussion last week, we came across once again the the, uh, what do you say, the subject of universalism. <laughs> so uh, now I, I felt the need for us to just pause uh, and on uh, and today, just get into a little discussion on universalism, but I'm doing it slightly differently from a typical Bible study. I'm obviously not going to, you know, get into a, uh, the discussion of various scriptures. What happens is those who are for universalism will have a whole list of scriptures. Those who are against universalism will have another whole bunch of scriptures. And then they are trying to butt heads with the two lists, you know, and uh, they are trying to say, well, they're trying to prove their point. But I, as far as Grace Communion International is concerned, we are trying to see if we can take a slightly more uh, let's say, if, if I can use the word, a more balanced or a more mature approach to this uh, discussion. And I will show you why we are going to be taking a particular position. So I'm going to get into this discussion today, and I'm specifically looking at it from, a, from our church's perspective, you know, especially from where we reformed, where we've come from our theological perspectives in the past and what we believe today. So it will be a lot of reading again. So please uh, allow me and indulge me in that. But let me go ahead and share my screen at this moment and bring up some of those uh, uh, points that I'd like to share with you. Uh, I have just uh, put on my screen. Let me just see if I can just widen that. Now, uh, if you can just confirm, if you can see all see the screen, right? Thank you. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the subject we want to get into: universalism. Um, let me begin by moving to four uh, theories of salvation, especially from a a Christian perspective. But I presume you can also look at it from a religious perspective, that is, uh, various religions will have its own uh, approaches to salvation. Uh, so let me just put some points here, and I borrowed this from an author, which I will acknowledge uh, later in the, uh, you know, in the discussion. So one is called exclusivism, where uh, the teaching is salvation only found in Christianity as a religion, or if you can replace Christianity and put any religion there, that would be the position of exclusivists. Uh, there are exclusivists in all religious, uh, you know, think, uh, you know, schools of thought. So 
Uh, and it says anyone who is not a Christian will go to hell. That is uh, the traditional Christian uh, evangelical perspective, which would apply to many other religions. They all say salvation is found only in their religion. And of course, we Christians uh, can beat all of them by saying that within Christianity, there may be some groups where salvation is only found in that group. Now, so we, we take the cake in doing that. <laughs> But this is uh, uh, an exclusivist approach to salvation. Secondly, there is an inclusivist approach where some adherents of other religions may find salvation, but it is still Jesus Christ who saves them. This is once again a Christian perspective that we believe that uh, others are included as long as they can believe in Jesus Christ, as long as they will submit to and subscribe to a belief in Jesus Christ. You may be from any religion, but that is necessary. So that is an inclusivist approach. A third perspective is a pluralistic approach where one's own religion is not the sole and exclusive source of truth, hence may be found in principle in any religion, though not necessarily. So uh, pluralism is a belief that all religions lead to God and uh, there is no exclude. I mean to say uh, the truth is not exclusive to just one religion or one school of thought. And so in other words, salvation is available to anyone subscribing to, you know, a particular, you know, religion. And finally, uh, universalism, which we are going to discuss today, that no matter who you are, where you are, where you come from, all people will be saved. All right. So I've taken, I borrowed this from uh, Michael Black, uh, who had uh, done a little study on this. So these are perspectives that people have. Now, uh, let me zero in then on universalism, because in the Christian religion, this has been discussed quite uh, extensively and it has lent itself to a lot of controversies and so there are uh, those who are for it and those who are against it. But what is basically universalism? And uh, I'm taking some of this from our own uh, uh, GCI literature where it says, belief that everyone will be saved regardless of whether they are good or bad, repentant or unrepentant, accepting or rejecting Jesus. So this is how uh, they would, uh, you know, how universalism is described, that no matter what your circumstance, what your background, what you do or don't do, uh, you basically will be saved, perhaps in the ultimate analysis. A second perspective uh, of universalism is there is no such thing as hell. Uh, you know, the traditional belief about hell where uh, those who do not uh, match up, uh, do not qualify, will be sent to, you know, so-called hell, which of course is uh, a term used in the Bible, where they will be torment for all eternity. Uh, but universalists don't believe that there is anything like hell. Now, there are various versions of this, I must say. Some will believe that there is a hell but some will believe that there is a purgatory, which is a, uh, what do you say, a, a second degree kind of a hell, <laughs> where, you are, where you are refined, you are purged of your sinfulness, and then you can graduate uh, to heaven, right? Now, if you don't uh, reform, you are then demoted into the second hell or third hell, whatever you know, reference you might use. So this is uh, another aspect of universalism. Uh, and next is, uh, let me just move this around a bit. Uh, God, universalists believe that God is so persistent that uh, God will not rest until he has wooed back to himself even the most hardened sinner. And, and they go to the extent of saying, even the devil and his angels are going to be redeemed. <laughs> so this is uh, how some, uh, you know, 
the universalists think. So everything is going to be redeemed, heaven and earth, you know, the cosmos, which will also include devil and his angels. Now, this can be very, very controversial and perhaps heretical uh, for, uh, for some of us uh, who might not subscribe to this kind of a thing. So this is the various, uh, you know, you could say perspectives of universalism. But the common ground here is that uh, everyone, regardless of, you know, what their belief or don't, or don't believe, will eventually be saved. Now, I must also mention that some would believe that uh, it's only in Jesus you have salvation, but God will persuade everyone finally to believe in Jesus. So that is another thought that is uh, coming out of this uh, major or, uh, you know, bigger thought of universalism. All right, let's move to the next slide then. Uh, does it incarnational Trinitarian theology teach universalism? Now, the reason I mentioned this is many of you will know that we in Grace Communion International, we subscribe to, majorly subscribe to something we term as incarnational Trinitarian theology. I think most of you will recognize that from our reformation in the past of uh, being non, being against the Trinity, we have come to embrace what we have ca called incarnational Trinitarian theology. Now, does this school of thought teach universalism? Once again, I'll give you two quotes from uh, two of our uh, leaders of the church. One is from Mr. Dikach. Uh, he says in one of his articles, the noted Swiss theologian Karl Barth, uh, Thomas F. Torrance, who's from actually from uh, England, James B. Torrance, his brother, did not teach it. Neither does Perichoresis Ministries director Baxter Kruger and the author of The Shack, William Paul. Uh, they do not uh, subscribe to universalism. Uh, the reason I mention this is uh, people like Karl Barth, uh, Thomas Torrance, James Torrance, and of course, uh, Baxter Kruger. And uh, I can include, uh, uh, I can't get his name right away, uh, but there's another, various theologians uh, are subscribing to the Trinitarian theological perspective. And these theologians do not subscribe to universalism. So we would conclude that uh, Trinitarian theology does not teach universalism in the way it is taught by or believed by, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, believed by ev evangelical Christian or traditional Christian, uh, not traditional Christian, but uh, uh, the universalists who believe in uh, what we discussed a little earlier. Okay, let me go to the second point there. And this is from uh, uh, Gary Dedo who is uh, the president of our, our, uh, of our uh, seminary. He says, some condemn or dismiss our theological stance by labeling it universalism, uh, Arminianism, or Calvinism. However, we, we have no need to be aligned with a particular school of theology. Though each school has understandings deserving our consideration, each also has significant weaknesses that obscure important even crucial elements of the biblical revelation. So this is how Gary Dedo uh, concludes. In other words, what he is saying is, we who, who subscribe to Trinitarian theology do not subscribe to universalism or Arminianism or Calvinism. Uh, we have a, a, a perspective which might accept certain, you know, uh, accept aspects of Arminianism and Calvinism or universalism, but we do not subscribe to it completely. So that is what uh, he says. So basically speaking, Trinitarian theology does not subscribe to universalism in the way it's described uh, in that previous slide that I showed you. Okay, let's continue to move on then. I want to ask another question here. Uh, what is our position? What is our G GCI position, Grace Communion International? Let me just uh, lay that out very clearly, and then I will explain uh, why we believe in the uh, the way we, you know, the, uh, the the way we do. Okay. The first point I'd like to mention here is that we say universalism is a biblically unsound doctrine, which says that in the end all souls 
whether human, angelic, or demonic, will be saved by God's grace. Some universalists argue that repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ are irrelevant. This is our official position, right? That we believe uh, universalism is biblically unsound. Now you might say, how can you say that? <laughs> because there are verses that you, that you can pick out of the Bible that tends to indicate universalism, uh, universalism to be true. But uh, we conclude, and I will explain why it says that. Perhaps we can say uh, from this particular uh, you know, statement, the fact that demonic uh, you know, redemption is something that the Bible has no reference to. And so if we are strictly biblical, we cannot conclude that demonic, the demonic world can be redeemed. Uh, once again, that is how we would look at it. And certainly to say that repentance toward God and faith in Jesus are irrelevant are definitely biblically unsound. All right. So that is the reason why we use a fairly strong term that it is biblically unsound. All right. But hang on, uh, there are thoughts that might just be a little bit, you know, uh, interesting for you to notice. Let me go to the second point here. Uh, we are further explained in our uh, official position. In Jesus Christ, who is God's elect uh, for our sakes, all humanity is elect. But that does not necessarily mean that all humans will ultimately accept God's free gift. God desires that all come to repentance. And he has created and redeemed humanity for true fellowship with him. But true fellowship can never constitute a forced relationship. We believe that in Christ, God makes gracious and just provision for all, even for those who at death appear not to yet believe the gospel. But all who remain hostile to God remain unsaved by their own choice. So we explain this a little bit further by saying that humanity has been elected because it is in Jesus that humanity is elected. Jesus Christ took humanity and redeemed all of humanity. In that respect, humanity as a whole is uh, coming under the redemption of Jesus Christ. All right. So uh, the election that we talk about uh, is not for exclusion, but is actually for inclusion. The elect, uh, which is Jesus, finally elects all of humanity and brings them under his saving grace. But the interesting thing here is that does not mean to say that all humans will ultimately accept God's free gift. And that once again, we look, at, we look into the biblical scriptures and it seems to indicate that some are going to reject God's freely given grace. That is what is the indication. And that is why we cannot in all sincerity say that everyone ultimately will be saved. I mean, at least, uh, we reserve that judgment at this moment, all right? Uh, I just also want to mention that uh, even though it is God's desire that all comes to repentance, uh, he is not forcing that relationship upon them. Uh, they have to freely choose. Uh, and, and we believe from the biblical scriptures that humanity has been made with the freedom to uh, choose. Uh, they are not uh, robots created to, you know, uh, have no choice whatsoever. Uh, we, I think in the past we have discussed this, humanity is a very unique creation in all of uh, the cosmos. And we have that image of God, we have the interaction between the spiritual and the physical. And so we are a very special creation. And one of it is the fact that we can make choices. And God Believes, we believe that God has given us the choice, all right? Now, another very important point from there I'd like to make is 
that God makes gracious provision uh, for even for those who, who at death appear not to have yet believed the gospel. That is something we had discussed even last time. That we believe that God is not so unkind that those who have no opportunity to hear and know about Jesus will be lost for all eternity. We believe there is some provision that is made and how that provision or what is that provision, maybe we will not be able to fully explain and fully fathom at this time. But those who remain hostile to God are actually unsaved by their own choice. It is not God's choice that uh, he cons consigns some to the eternal uh, damnation. But it is their own choice to remain in a sense of darkness. So this basically is the GCI position. But let me just move on and make some clarifications uh, to our official position. All right. The first clarification I'd like to make is this. Uh, careful students of the Bible recognize that whereas we need not rule out the idea that God will save everyone. The scriptures are not conclusive. Therefore, we should not be dogmatic about this issue. Right? That is something after careful study, we believe that, that it is God's desire and it is not outside his purview that he cannot save everyone. Uh, but if you are strictly scriptural, the scriptures just does not give us, you know, enough proof to show that everyone will be saved. It definitely talks about hell. It does, definitely talks about those who are cast into outer darkness. And so when you put it all together, uh, there, there is a picture which is incomplete. And for some reason, God has left it that, that way. And maybe that will force us to conclude that we should not be dogmatic. Whether God will save everyone or not is something in God's uh, domain of judgment. It is not ours to finally pronounce a judgment and worse still, pronounce a judgment on anyone that we don't like to say, hey, uh, I like this guy to be in, uh, in hellfire, right? So, uh, so that is one a very important conclusion that we want to make. Secondly, however, uh, how, however, to ardently desire for all humanity to be saved and for no one uh, to suffer in uh, one moment. I get these uh, notifications and it covers my screen. <laughs> Yeah, let me go back to that second point. However, to ardently desire for all humanity to be saved and for no one to suffer in hell does not make you a heretic. <laughs> so in other words, if you believe in universalism, uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, we don't uh, label them as heretics, uh, even though we would like to hang on to this position that we cannot be dogmatic. Uh, the scriptures are inconclusive. So uh, in that respect, you know, we should uh, reserve judgment and let it let God be the final uh, judge in all of these matters, especially when there is no, no clarity. So this is how we clarify. Remember, our official position is we cannot accept universalism in the way we read the scriptures at this time. But we also believe that there is there, are, there is an inconclusiveness to it, and hence we will not take a dogmatic position, uh, you know, on this. Right? Let me just uh, lead you through two more or three more slides, and then we will stop for some discussion. Why do we take this position? Uh, just a few points to discuss there. Let me read. Universalism should not be confused with the universal or cosmic scope of the effectiveness of the saving work of Christ. In Jesus Christ, who is God's elect for our sakes, all humanity is elect. That does not mean we can say for certain that all humans will ultimately accept God's gift. But we can hope 
that this is the case. So you begin to see the tension, you know, between the two. The tension is all of humanity has been included in Christ's saving, redemptive work. Because Christ is the elect, he has now included all of humanity. All right, so that is the biblical truth we read from the scriptures. But that does not mean to say that all humans will ultimately accept God's gift of salvation, right? He makes it available, but some may still decide for uh, not electing to be part of the redemption. And that, I think like we said uh, in the past, that is the ultimate madness. Right? When you deny reality, the reality being that Christ has included you and that is the only reality. And that is the ultimate madness. And that is why the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He become, that is the ultimate fool. It is not that he is intellectually, uh, you know, he does not have high IQ. Uh, the fool is denying reality that is staring him in the face. So this is why we take the position that we have. A second point I'd like to bring out here is when we say that all people are forgiven, saved and reconciled in Christ, we mean that while we all belong to Christ, not all are in communion with him. So while God has reconciled all to himself, not all are yet trusting and living in that reconciliation. This is something we have come to understand maybe after our reformation. Uh, you know, in the past, we uh, we necessarily didn't subscribe to this kind of way uh, of explanation, right? We believe that all people are forgiven, in one sense, saved and reconciled in Christ. That is the, what we could say, objective reality. But the objective must become subjective. You have to participate in it. On many occasions, I've used the example of, uh, you know, uh, your bank account. Somebody may put one crore in your bank account, right? So you have one, you are a karodbati, but unless you cash it and use it, you are, uh, you may be a karodpati, but you're not experiencing it. You're not enjoying it. You are not, you are not, with, you know, uh, uh, actually uh, coming to use it. So the participation is necessary. So uh, that's why we say not all are in communion with him, right? Not all have come into that reconciliatory reality. They want to stay outside of it. And that is one of the reasons why we conclude that universalism as such may not necessarily be true. I think I have one more point in the slide. Yes, I do. Uh, let me move this uh, thing around a bit. Yeah. All right. Here it says, that is why ours is a ministry, not of condemnation, but of the announcement of Christ's finished work of reconciliation, just as Paul exhorts us. So we have, we have the way we preach the gospel is not to condemn people. Because we know in Christ, there is no condemnation left. Christ has taken the condemnation upon himself. And he has freed us. He has redeemed us. He has brought us complete redemption. So we announce that this is what Christ has done. But that is the reason why Paul also says, be reconciled. God has finished his work of reconciliation. Now you have to come to actually uh, make it your own. You have to, uh, you know, wear that coat, if I can use that metaphor, right? A, a brand new coat has been given to you. You can take away your soiled coat and now put on the new coat. But if you don't, then of course, uh, once again, you are uh, uh, of your own choice rejecting the priceless gift of salvation that Jesus Christ has made available. Let me move to the next uh, uh, slide. And this is my last slide. Hence, what is what should be our attitude then? Right. Uh, this should be our attitude. 
since the Bible communicates that it is God's desire for all to come to him in repentance, uh, to receive his gracious and costly forgiveness, why would that not also be the desire for all followers of Jesus? Should we desire for others something less than God desires? So this is a, a challenge for, 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 for us uh, left by, uh, you know, uh, what we understand from the scriptures. You know, it is God's desire that everybody be saved. That, that is his universal desire, you could say. So uh, we don't have to have anything other than that kind of a desire. Right? So we also should desire and pray for, you know, uh, all to come to repentance. But whether that will actually happen and take place, once again, remains slightly uh, clouded in scripture, uh, maybe not given for us to fully understand at this time. I think that is basically what I'd like to share with you. Uh, let me just see if I can move this around. Yes, uh, let me stop sharing there. Yeah, we're back to the, the main uh, gallery view. Let me open it up for any questions that you may have had. I, I understand that this has been a little, uh, what do you say, um, quite heavy a theological discussion. Uh, once again, you notice that I basically went through how we are reasoning through with regards to the subject. Now, I can go through a whole lot of these lists, you know, this list and this that list, uh, but maybe we can do that another time. And why many scriptures indicate that universalism may ne necessarily not be true. All right. But uh, we are not dogmatic. And we learned that from our reformation. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you can be so dogmatic that, you know, you can make all kinds of crazy conclusions and we don't want to fall into that pit again. Anil, you have a thought. Go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the statements there said that church doesn't necessarily believe in uh, Calvinism and, and, and some of the other things. Now, one of the basic tenets of Calvinism is the doctrine of election. Yeah. So the, as the church does not believe in the doctrine of election. Okay, uh, well, to simply answer that, the, the church believes in the doctrine of election, but the way election is understood by the Calvinists is different from our understanding. <laughs> you know, what if, yeah, yeah the, the way Calvinists understand election is that you are elected and hence you are the chosen one and you are separate. Everybody else who is not elected are basically damned for eternal for eternity. That is not what we subscribe to. When we say election, somebody is elected. For example, Abraham, uh, he was chosen. But why was he chosen? Why was he elected? So that the whole world can be elected. And remember, it is said through you. The whole world will be blessed. So election for us is inclusive, not exclusive. For the Calvinists, it's exclusive. Election for them is others to be excluded. No, that's not what we believe. We believe Jesus is elected, who then elects all of humanity, includes all of humanity. So in Jesus, all of humanity is elected. That is the difference between our understanding of election. That's what we discussed last time, or, or we brought it up. That does that mean that all who are not elected at this time are damned? You know, that's not really that should not really be the case. Yeah. Although the church earlier we used to believe in the second and third resurrection, where all will be preached and all that. But I think uh, the Bible is not very specific about that, right? Uh, yeah. Once again. The Calvinist thinking is that uh, if there is a group that is elected predestined, then the others are predestined, that is predestined for damnation. One is predestined for salvation. The other is predestined for damnation. That is called double predestination <laughs> uh, uh, in the Calvinistic thought. But uh, mm -hmm. we don't subscribe to that. Election is for the sake of 
a special role you play to bring all the others in. That is the election that we believe in. That is what Jesus has done. Jesus is the elect, you know, the, uh, the one who God has chosen to include all of humanity and he brings in all of humanity. But then people have a choice to make. Right? Okay. I'm not sure. If, I hope that clarifies. You know, wonderful. Yeah, it does. Good. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts? Suryamurthy, you had a thought? Uh, I noticed you have... Uh, I was a bit. I was a bit confused. <clears throat> you were talking about two groups. One about the people who have never heard about God. The other group, other group, who died hostile to God. Okay. Uh, I I did. Uh, I probably I did not pay attention to what you were saying about those who okay. died hostile to God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I said basically was that uh, knowing God and his nature of love and his desire to want to save and to include all of humanity. We believe that those who may not have heard of Christ, because we believe there is salvation only in Christ. See, that is that is non negotiable. Right. We believe salvation is only in Christ. But those who have not had the opportunity to believe or not had the opportunity to fully understand the, uh, the ramifications of not believing in Christ, we believe there is going to be some just provision for them. Now, how that just provision is available is something that I cannot explain because God has not given us that blueprint. In the past, we thought the blueprint was the resurrections. Maybe it is still maybe that, but we don't want to be dogmatic on that. So, did you understand, uh, Surimurti, my point there? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> right. You know, if I can, uh, while you you're thinking of your comments or questions, I, I can I, I can uh, uh, refer you to the parable of the uh, prodigal son. Uh, you know, and uh, what a what a fantastic you know uh, parable that is. There is so much you can glean from that. Of course, we must be careful that we don't overstretch it. But it's interesting. One is God gives those who wants to go into a, a sense of doubt. He gives that opportunity for them. I mean, in other words, He allows free choice. But Notice what happens to the second son. You know, the, the first son repents and he comes back. And even before he can start his speech to say that, you know, just accept me as your hired servant, God embraces him and, you know, brings him into the fold. Uh, but the second son is very upset and he leaves. And God goes to plead with him. That shows God's desire for wanting the entire family there. Okay. But did the second son repent and come back? I don't know. <laughs> it is left in suspended animation, the parable. <laughs> so that is where we believe we cannot conclude. Maybe that son would have repented. Maybe not. So we cannot conclude that everybody will be saved. Everybody will accept the provision of Jesus. Uh, some may not. I don't know. So that is the reason why we, we conclude that some people may decide to go away from or reject the uh, provision that God makes. So, so this is somewhat more or less what we were believing in worldwide church of God. Am I right? Uh, well, we we did not. There is a difference. We they, there are some similar aspects, but there are there is a difference. For example, we did not believe that everybody has come under the blood of Jesus. Uh, we had more of an Ar Armenian thought there, that we had to make a decision to make Jesus Christ's uh, redemption active in our life. That that is what. 
we believed in the past. That is the Armenian thought. That is not true. We don't accept that. Whether you like it or not, you have come under the blood of Jesus. But you have to receive it. So that is the difference between us and Arminianism. But secondly, yes, we do believe that God in his justness and in his love will make, will not condemn someone who had had no opportunity to know. That is what we, uh, we still hold on to. Makes sense. <laughs> Franklin, you had a thought. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. <coughs> Sir, uh, uh, our point is, sir, salvation is found in Christ alone. Am I correct? Absolutely. Uh, so, sir, what about the people who lived uh, before Christ could start his preaching from day one, from the time of Adam till <laughs> Christ started preaching? How, do, how would you, such people be hanging? <laughs> well, well, they are not hanging. <laughs> uh, they, are, uh, they are included, past, present and future are all included in the salvic, salvific redemption of Jesus Christ. All humanity is included. All right. So uh, now, uh, how are they going to, uh, you know, finally come to be in Christ? Now, these are some things we cannot answer. Once again, there is the resurrection. Uh, maybe that has some, you know, will provide some information. But I really don't know because, the, 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 like I said, uh, the scriptures do not give us the, uh, you know, the luxury of that blueprint. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Praveen, you have anything to add? Just a thought. Book of Jonah. Uh, sorry, let's uh, finish with Rifa and then we'll come to Suri Murthy. Yeah. Just a thought about the prodigal son, the elder son. Uh, he uh, was actually uh, more like the Pharisees, like he believed he was doing everything right, the same way the Pharisees do. And we also in our time have Pharisees who just adhere to the laws in a different way altogether, when we should be more listening to be more open-minded, oh, yes, and considerate time. Right. and kind and love. Absolutely. So that is that is where, you know, uh, understanding the new covenant is so vital. And that is something we had missed uh, in the in the former, uh, you know, so-called so WCG, that, you know, perspective. Uh, we missed the full understanding of the new covenant. Right. Suri Murthy, go ahead. You had a thought? In the book of Jonah, we find the people of Nineveh were very wicked and very violent. But in the end, God says, as if they are very innocent. <laughs> These people who do not know their right hand from their left hand. Right. You, you see the love of God. Is my voice yes, clear? Yes, yes Suri Murthy, we can hear you. But at the same time, they book repented. Of John, uh, in the book of Jonah, yeah. see, he was going to destroy Nineveh because they were violent and they were very wicked. But ultimately, what God says, they are very innocent. They do not know their right hand from their left hand. God intended to save them. Okay. So, this is the richness of God's love. Yeah. Which but, he, at, but at the same time, the, 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 when Jonah preached to them, they repented. And, and that's yes, how yes. God saved them. Yes. If they had not repented, yes, even yes. if God's will was there, obviously he wouldn't have saved them. Yes, yes. Yeah. You are right. Absolutely that's right. Awesome. Uh, if I can just clarify, so, uh, I'm just thinking about the, something. What I'm Suri, just thinking about. Go finish. Suri Murthy, go ahead, finish. <laughs> I was just thinking about God's mind. Yeah. However, we may be wicked. Right. Once we repent, 
she oh, yeah. treats it as if we are very uh, children. Okay, absolutely. No, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, while, I, while I accept what you're saying, I must mention that uh, you use the word innocent. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that we understand that God does not condone sin and wickedness. Uh, he has to deal with it and he will bring it to an end. Of course, we know it has come to an end in Jesus. Uh, so God is not going to ignore their wickedness. Uh, that is the reason why he sent a prophet to warn them that they must turn away from this wickedness, which thankfully they did. But the richness of God's love is seen that even though they were so wicked, God was willing to uh, help them, you know, come to an understanding that they need to turn away. Right. So innocence must be put in those in those terms. Correct. After they accept the, after they accept God's reproof, right. advice, whatever it is. All right. Mm -hmm. Surimurti, that means there is hope for Trump. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, a recount is going on. <laughs> yes. Praveen, you had a thought? Uh, Yeah, as so we're talking about uh, universalism, uh, Pastor Dan brought uh, some perspectives regarding the universalism. What do people think about uh, uh, universalism? He brought about inclusivism and exclusivism, and uh, those are uh, those are considered as general perspectives, like uh, what religions uh, think. Uh, it's about uh, various religions. Some say only certain religions will take us to God. Some certain religions will not take us to God. Uh, the, uh, this universalism is a very huge topic, but uh, primarily as we are discussing our conversation went on towards this way, the universal, uh, universal, we, were, we discussed more about universalism in terms of or especially related to our salvation. So when we talk about universalism related to human salvation, we need to be, we need to define what salvation is various perspectives of salvation a lot of times we are using certain words but uh, there is uh, there is always a great uh, communication difficult, uh, gap uh, as we are using those words the connotations every person have for those words is uh, i mean are different so when you say salvation it may mean different to you and it may mean different to someone else i would like to bring before you a few perspectives of salvation and then uh, i will give the universalism to it for many people, uh, like you know, salvation is uh, self-realization. If you understood yourself, if you know about yourself, that means you are saved. That is a salvation for certain uh, certain religions. In certain religions, finding the absolute truth. In other words, finding uh, uh, for Gnostic cities, uh, finding the absolute mm -hmm. knowledge. And for certain groups in our own country, uh, salvation is uh, finding the ultimate God. And totally, we, idea, we we are going to dissolve in him, uh, evolve into him, which, uh, which can be extension of human life. You know, for uh, there may be some cycles which were going on. And from there, uh, you know, we should get rid of it. And ultimately, we should reach to the ultimate true God and where we find our, uh, we, we will be united to him. That is a salvation for some people. And when it comes to Christians also, there are others. For some people, salvation is uh, uh, freedom from sin. Uh, from For some people, salvation is freedom from punishment. I'm not going to be punished in hell. For some people, salvation is about going to heaven. It's all about going to heaven. It's about a destination, choose going to heaven or hell. And when we talk about salvation in Christian, uh, as Christians, the Bible, biblical perspective of salvation is uh, not about... Uh, Knowing ourselves completely, as some group says, or uh, evolving into the greater reality, or uh, attaining the absolute knowledge, or even it is not about a place or finding a destination where we go. When we talk about salvation in the Bible, uh, especially in Trinitarian perspective, we understand that uh, when we are saved, we are saved into a relationship. We should never ever forget this. This is the ground for all our understanding, for all our Trinitarian understanding. That is every subject we deal in Christian theology 
should be dealt relationally because the god we are worshiping is a relational god and he is a relationship and everything he does uh, and every aspect in our life is relational there is no aspect in life anything which is not relational so our salvation is also relational it is not about a place well so having said that we need to define universalism in terms of uh, relational uh, salvation you know so when we are saved we are saved into a relationship that's the reason bible says whoever believed in believed in him we are given the right to become the children of god and we become the bride of god and we are and god calls us children and he is our god we are his people that father son all these terms love reconciliation forgiveness all these are relational terms which have been used as we, as bible is explaining about salvation so when we are saved we are saved into a relationship in this uh, in this aspect so god is god who loves us and he wants to have relationship with us so universalism also have to be uh, de defined in these terms so god never forces love on anyone number one so universalism cannot exist because love never forces a universalism will be wrong if he forces he is not expressing his love actually he is uh, or, or taking control over people number two our salvation is only completed as pastor dan also previously explained about the banking uh, bank account thing uh, that's a very good explanation and even even better to think about better way uh, you know i fell in love with a girl unless she loves me back the relationship is not complete so both sides the re reciprocation of relationship also should be there so god from his side as we use the word objectively uh, he forgave all he reconciled all he embraced all but this particular thing is not complete until we reciprocate it until we accept it in faith love and acceptance of forgiveness when we do both sides do then only the salvation is complete otherwise it is not so when we are saved we we are aware the purpose of relationship is fellowship if we are not able to come in communion with god there is no point in talking about we are saved so the purpose of salvation is to come into relationship with god that's what jesus said they may be one with us as he prayed so uh, from his side he embraced all when we accept then only that that will be complete and uh, god since he is a true love he doesn't force us so from love perspective side this universalism cannot exist so we have to respond to him there is a hundred percent responsibility we have he embraced all as in christ he embraced everyone but in christ now do we embrace him or not that freedom has been given to us so god's work uh, is universal but not universal uh, universalism then we need to understand these two words universality universalism universalism is different christianity doesn't speak about universalism bible doesn't speak about universalism but it speak about speaks about universal reconciliation which is universality and uh, we there is nothing wrong as pastor said uh, we can be hopeful universalist universalist we can hope for everyone to be saved because not none of us not 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 from us beginning actually it's god who wants everybody to be saved so god himself is a hopeful universalist so nothing wrong in us to hope for everybody to be saved and still god himself is not manipulating us to accept him completely so we don't need to manipulate people by judging them you are in or you're out though that is none of our business we don't have anything we don't have any word for that we don't have anything in that and uh, there are few other aspects also especially where we when we talk about universalism that that are related to the nature of love and so maybe when we have time later we can uh, yeah. discuss about universalism especially defining the qualities of love and bringing those and applying them to our understanding of universalism having salvation uh, understanding salvation as a relationship so right so i would like thank you thank you for that time is just
gone by. Uh, but yes, that is uh, so very true. And it just reminds me of uh, uh, one place I had done a Bible study for a group uh, and we were talking about salvation. And there is uh, this, this uh, uh, you know, this idea of salvation going to heaven uh, is so very strong among many that, uh, you know, I, I made a comment which offended that person. I said, see, <laughs> salvation is not a 3BHK. No. <laughs> No, it's, it's not uh, because he said, what do you mean? You know, it's not a play. You mean to say I'm not going to enjoy the streets of gold and uh, you know, a table made of emerald. I, I said, that's, you know, I mean, uh, that is not salvation as such. You know, I mean, salvation is being in Christ, being in the embrace of the Trinitarian God. Uh, and of course, uh, Jesus says there are mansions for us in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it's a place within the Trinitarian reality. It is not a room full of gold. <laughs> so I was thankfully just Jesus to said that. Thankfully, yeah. Jesus said that statement before his crucifixion, not before the ascension. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I was just trying to tell them, you may have... Uh, a, a, a mansion and a, and a palace, but if you don't have Jesus, you are nowhere. You know, you'll be the most miserable person. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for your participation, and uh, we we'll look forward to connecting again. Uh, if uh, Sheila is still with us, would you like to close in prayer, Sheila? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we, for the time that we had together to learn your word. Thank you, Father, that we could discuss and learn from each other in a very loving and caring and mature way. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in us, for helping us to understand what you have been trying to teach us. Help us to understand what you tell us in a uh, in a deeper way, in a better way. And as we continue learning in the coming weeks and months ahead, we pray, Father, that we learn, that what we learn may help us to love you and to love one another more and more. And because we know that is what you want us to do ultimately. And may everything that we do bring honor and glory to your name, Father. We pray and ask you all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.